Hello, my name is Catherine, and I read, ah, oh, it's just the ballad of Never After, I think that's the name, the sequel to Once Upon a Broken Heart, basically the day it came out, um, it's been a while since then, um, I look a mess, but I have not stopped thinking about it and how much there has to be a third book. Like, it can't end like that, right? So, um, this is just going to be me talking about how I feel about this book because, spoiler, I really liked it. Um, so I'm going to talk about why I liked it. I'm going to talk about, um... how it was different for me from the first book, like the experience of reading it. And then I'm going to talk about that ending. If you read it, you know what I'm talking about. So there will be some spoilers. I am going to be spoiling. Um, ignore my hair. I was in one of those moods where I just, my hair couldn't be touching my neck or I was going to scream. Um, I'm going to be looking at it on my iPad um, so that I don't forget anything. Um, so just like I did with uh, Once Upon a Broken Heart, when the third book comes out, because there has to be a third one, it can't end like that, um, when it comes out, I want to do a reading vlog with this one too, where I just sort of like reread it. So I remember where we are in the story and I'll annotate it. And I'll vlog it again like I did the last one. Oh uh, yes, it is the Ballad of Never After. Stephanie Garber, you have a freaking chokehold on me. I have not been able to read Young Adult. I'm calling this Young Adult. Um, because the characters are the age range for Young Adult. And while this book is like a little bit steamier than the first one, it's not really steamy at all. Like... So I'm going to call it Young Adult. I don't know if it actually is. Um, but I am one of those people who consider New Adult a subgenre of the Young Adult genre. And yes, book genres are weird. Um, so obviously this is a fantasy book. If you've read it, you would know. And I'm also not the biggest fantasy girl, mostly because I'm really picky. Um, but the biggest problem I have with contemporary romantic fantasy books written for a female audience is that the romance, the romance tends to become the most important thing in the book. And I don't necessarily always blame the author for that. I think, um... The publishing industry as a whole can sort of take the blame for that one I had to plug my phone in um because this idea that women don't enjoy stories where romance isn't the main focus is like completely false but um anyway the world bid the world building because of that tends to be put on the back burner and so a lot of times I find that the world doesn't make sense or that the world that was carefully crafted in the beginning of the book or if it's a series and the first book tends to sort of fall apart as the series goes on because in order to fit in more of the romance and these forced love triangles and things like that the world has to be warped in a way that these new connections make sense and it doesn't always fit coherently into the rules of the world that are established from the get-go. And then I also have a problem with the main character of all the fantasy books being a uh, redhead. And then her being really freaking annoying and like kind of like a fantasy girl pick me. Like, oh, I don't like the other girls. I don't like fae, or I don't like vampires, or I don't like 
elves. I don't, oh, I don't read fantasy. Um, because of this, like, it annoys me to no end. And then I also think I kind of got burnt out on fantasy around the time there was that big dystopian boom, because while a lot of the dystopian was sort of focused on our own world, um, and what it would look like in the future when everything falls apart, a lot of it was also rooted in fantasy. And it, the, the young adult genre was oversaturated with it, and half of it wasn't good. Half of it was just poorly written knockoffs of things that were really well written and were popular for reasons other than the romance. Was the romance a factor? Yes. But was it the only thing that people liked about it? No. And they would take all the romance and then like half-ass everything else and put it out and market it like, oh, if you liked this, you'll like this. And then people would buy it and it would become a bestseller, but then it wasn't good. And then everyone was like, well, young adult fantasy just isn't good. People who write young adult books just aren't good writers, which is false. But anyway, tension over. The Ballad of Never After, Stephanie Garber, You Have Done It Again. This is a great book. I actually kind of, I've never read the Caravelle series. I had never even heard of the Caravelle series or Stephanie Garber. I saw a video of someone unboxing this like special edition version of Once Upon a Broken Heart from the UK and the book jacket, like you unfolded the inside of it and it looked like the illustrations from the storybook, the ballad of the, um, the archer and the fox or whatever the story is in here. Um, and it was so beautiful. <laughs> And unlike a lot of the other books that I had seen being sort of printed out on BookTok, no one was talking about it. So, and it's not that I think that BookTok suggests bad books. My problem with BookTok is they hype up a book and then I get really excited to read it and then it doesn't always live up to the expectations that were instilled in me by BookTok. And so the less hype a book has when I decide to pick it up, the more likely I am to enjoy it. Um, it's the same thing with like movies. If I don't get to see a movie I want to see right away and then everyone starts talking about how great it is, I'm afraid to watch it because what if I don't think it's great? Or what if everyone's telling me how great it is and how great it is and then in my head I'm like, oh, so it's gonna be like this good. And then if it falls even just a little shy of that, then I'm like, well, everyone lied to me. That wasn't as good as everyone said it was. So now I don't like it. And then it leaves like a bitter taste in my mouth, but the, corner of book talk I was on everyone was talking about um shadow and bone because I think that was about the time they announced the tv show and I was like okay I haven't heard of this book before but this book jacket is gorgeous I want to know what this is so in her caption she obviously had the name of the book um and I went and I looked it up and I used the the Overdrive app. I'm in South Korea right now. So I used the Overdrive app in my library card from America to check out Once Upon a Broken Heart from my local library. And luckily they had it. I didn't have to wait for it, got it immediately. And then I read it in the Kindle app on my iPad. And <laughs> I, read it in, I read it in one go, um, couldn't put it down. It was fantastic and the ballad of never after dropped while i was at work i was teaching a class and when i tell you i could not wait for that last class to be over and i love those kids that is a great class fun class to teach that day i was like man these three hours is going to drag because i knew what was waiting for me i knew what was waiting for me when i got home and okay so the first thing i want to say about the Ballad of Never After is that the sexual tension between the two leads is a lot stronger than it is in the first book, and it should be. It should be because it was building steadily through the first book. There was something there. They maybe didn't really like each other, but there was definitely some sort of like sexual attraction. Um, it was very clear that they like at least cared about each other on some level. 
Um, so it wasn't a surprise for me when the sexual tension just kept building and building in this book, especially with the two of them getting jealous over and over and over again. And it was very funny to me watching Evangeline try to justify her feelings for Drax. Um, and I didn't find it annoying. And normally when main characters are in denial of their feelings, I find it really annoying. And I'll tell you why I didn't find it annoying here. Because it made sense to me for her to be questioning her feelings. Because she doesn't completely trust Jax. She is attracted to him, but she doesn't trust him. Because at the end of the first book, we find out that he, like, betrayed her, kind of, by, like, not telling her the whole truth about, um, her husband, the prince, Prince Apollo. Um, so, and then, like, we, we've seen and we know that one of his powers is he can make people fall in love with other people at his own will. And we also know <laughs> that, like, part of Jax's whole thing is that women sort of flock to him not because they actually like him but because of who he is and as one of the fates he's the prince of hearts and so like it made sense to me for her to be questioning whether the things she was feeling were genuine or if it was part of the magic because it just made sense and then when they were in the hollow and that magic is very like subdued and he was behaving very out of character when he was being so gentle with her and like asking her to like snuggle with him for like one night like that's out of character for him he normally didn't wear his heart on his sleeve around her quite so obviously so like it made sense to me that she would think that that wasn't real that that was the magic of the hollow making him do that and so like within the structure of the world that had already been set up it made sense that she would question that so that's why i didn't find that annoying because the ballad of never after does not have to deconstruct any of the world building done in the first book to make itself make sense which I really enjoyed. I also really enjoyed that we got more of Jax's backstory. Um, we find out a little bit more about his life before he became a fate, which was very interesting. And I would like to say that I did call it back in the first book when he had all those copies of the Ballad of the Art of the Archer and the Fox. Um, I kind of figured that I didn't think it would be so literally, but I kind of figured that he would end up being sort of like the archer, at least for her, because she is literally Evangeline Fox. Um, I thought it was cute how they were always like playing on that, like her dressing as like a fox for the masquerade ball for, with Lala, and um, when Apollo proposes to her in the first book, how he dresses up like the archer, and like the, those sorts of things, just like, I thought it was all very cute. And then come to find out, Jax was literally the archer from the story. That's part of his curse. The girl he was in love with when he was still a human. And then he became a fate and got his curse. And they were so in love and she wouldn't stay away from him. So he kissed her and then she died. Like, that's a fantastic backstory. Like, I get why he's afraid to, like, actually have feelings for women. Like, <laughs> that has to be traumatizing. Um, it's so good. It's so good. I will say, I've watched a couple other people talk about this um, on BookTube, and everyone sort of had the same general consensus. The plot in this one isn't nearly as driving forward as the plot in the first book and if I had one criticism of this book it would be that some parts of it you we spend longer in the moment and I think we need to for the plot but this book sort of felt like it was more about 
unraveling Jax's character. Because in order for the ending of this book to make sense, we have to unravel his character. But when you're reading it for the first time, it doesn't make sense. So it's like, we're wasting an awful lot of this book sitting here doing nothing when they should be taking action because they need to get the arches open and they need to get these stones. And the longer they have these stones, the more likely they are to be killed by someone else who also wants the stones for whatever reason they want them for. And there's all these, and there's other pink haired girls that have been murdered before trying to collect the stones. And so it's like, well, we gotta, we gotta get a move on before she's murdered. And so you as the reader feel really urgent. It's like, why aren't we going faster? And it's like, oh, we're character building. So if I had one thing I would say about this book is I wish there had been a way for us to unravel Jax's character the way that was necessary while also keeping the pace driving forward the same way it did in the first book. Um, that being said, I still really, really enjoyed this book. I think the plot is good. It's a lot more vibey than the first book. We spent a lot of time just like vibing, especially the chapters that take place in the hollow because nothing really goes on there except for the unraveling of feelings and the like final figuring out of the rest of Jax's backstory on Evangeline's side because if you were like me everything was very obvious um and so like all signs are pointing towards Jax being the archer and I think the only reason Evangeline didn't figure it out on her own sooner was because she didn't want him to be the archer because then that would mean that the unhappy ending she he told her about was the truth because he would have actually have lived it. Um, and she would like to live in denial and think that they had a happily ever after. And so, yeah. Um, so all that happened. Um, I'm gonna talk about the ending now. Because what the fuck was that? Um, <laughs> there has to be a third book. So I know there's like quotes of her saying that it's either going to be a duology or a trilogy. And now I would say that most people who have finished the second book would agree that this is supposed to be a trilogy. But as far as I have known, as far as I know, and as far as I have seen, um, there have been no updates about whether or not there will be a third book, but there has to be. There has to be. Because essentially what has happened is, this is your warning, I'm about to, I'm about to spoil the whole ending. Um, they get the Valerie arch open and the first time Jax doesn't go with them because he wants to go back in time. Um, he, or he's, he wants the Valerie Arch open so he can go back in time and do something. He wants to use these, the magic in the stones to time travel. And he says it's to get the girl that he loves. Um, the girl he, the princess from the South, um, that, he kissed and she didn't die but his heart started beating he was like he's like that is who I'm destined to be with because she's the first one who didn't die when I kissed her um so he's gonna go back and get her and Evangeline's like upset about it because they like each other um but instead she goes with um the vampire one with the helmet to unlock the Valerie arch and inside is the Valors. And turns out, God, what's his name? I'm skipping to the end. Chaos. Chaos is the Valor's son. And when he was murdered, he became the monster that they created when they turned him into a vampire and then he also became a fate um so his 
the Valors wake up, they're reunited with Chaos, and he has his helmet taken off because he hasn't eaten anything in years. <laughs> like so, so long because the Valors have been locked away for like ever now. Um, he hasn't eaten since they've been locked away because he's had this helmet on since before they were sealed inside the Ark. So, he accidentally kills Evangeline while sucking her blood, and Jax goes to save her, but he is too late. So the stones can only be used one time. He goes back in time just enough so that he can go with Chaos and Evangeline to open the arches. And he manages to stop Chaos from killing Evangeline. Prince Apollo shows up. And Prince Apollo, at the end of the first book, we discover is in a coma. He wakes up from the coma mysteriously and had a curse placed on him where he would always be able to find Evangeline and he would always try to kill her while remaining in love with her. Apollo knows something is going on between her and Jax. And while before Jax's magic, he was definitely not in love with Evangeline, there's something off about Apollo. And the book ends with God. There's something wrong with Apollo. Like, he's either not the Apollo he was before, or he's not who he was presenting himself as in the first book, because she and Apollo reunite, and she wanted the archers open so that she could get rid of the curse where he would try be like always trying to kill her. Um, so they get rid of that, and he somehow manages to erase all her memories. So as he's, like, touching her and holding her in place, she's, like, asking him to let her go because she wants to go after Jax, and Apollo's like, no, this is all Jax's fault. And he starts like pulling her memories out of her head and they disappear. And she like passes out. And then in the epilogue, she's with Apollo. She doesn't have any memories. She doesn't even remember him. And he's like, oh, you're safe with me. I'm your husband. But she's like, there's something weird about his reaction to me. Because I'm like, I've just woken up from being passed out. I've been crying hysterically. I'm still crying now. And he looks so happy. Like, he's smiling and being like, oh, I'm your husband. And so, um, there's going to be a third book. There has to be. There has to be. There has to be. There has to be. And <laughs> Apollo has to be the bad guy, Right? Right? And the third book is going to have to be about getting Evangeline's memories back, right? 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 Stephanie Garber, if there is not a third book, I <laughs> will do nothing. <laughs> but I will just be very angry. 
This book is almost 30 minutes long now. I have aired my grievances about <laughs> young adult fantasy, young adult in general. Um, this book, this ending. So I'm gonna end this here. My fake microphone today is this pom-pom fruit pen from Kyobo. Um, I'm pretty sure it's just a knockoff of the ones that you can get on Jeju Island, but I've never been to Jeju Island, so here we are. Um, and I will see you guys next time. There has to be a third book. <laughs>